Welcome to The Watcher, I'm your cult leader Tom Pot, and I just watched episode one of Moon Knight. And it's a good thing I'm back, because a lot of people online seem really confused by what they just watched. Uh, so yeah, don't worry, I'm here to help straighten things out for the next six weeks. The Watcher is back, breaking down Moon Knight, trying to make sense of all this nonsense and craziness and folklore and Egypt and multiple personalities. My word, there's a lot going on. If that sounds like something you might need help with or want to come back to, be sure to press that subscribe button because uh, we've got plenty more Marvel stuff coming up as well really, really soon. If you like it, give it a like. Hey, anyway, that's the plugs out of the way. <laughs> Man, we kind of need to talk a bit about Moon Knight because I feel like this episode plays really differently if you know about Moon Knight and if you don't know about Moon Knight. I will admit I'm a char someone who doesn't know as much about that character as some of the other characters in the Marvel Universe. But it's a character that's very complex and very unique. So I'll give a bit of a an overview, I guess, of the Moon Knight character. And I might do this a couple of times when I do the Watcher this year. Because the Disney Plus shows this year are very different than last year. Because last year the shows were established characters, the movies were new characters. And this year it's reversed. A lot of the shows coming this year are featuring new characters being introduced into the MCU. And one of those is Moon Knight. The first of those is Moon Knight. Even though, you know, we don't know how connected this is to the MCU yet. Uh, which I might get to later on. So, the question is, who is Moon Knight? Moon Knight is Mark Spector. Uh, which is interesting because if you've read the synopsis of the show and now watched the episode, which I assume you have if you're watching this, why well, are you watching it otherwise? <laughs> um, they don't introduce him as Mark Spector. But Mark Spector is the, the main identity. And why do you say main identity, Tom? It's because Mark Spector has... Uh, disassociative Identity Disorder, which used to colloquially be known as Multiple Personalities. Uh, he is someone who, in, historically in the comics, sometimes they said he had schizophrenia, uh, which is kind of problematic. They don't really ever say that anymore and kind of distance himself uh, from that very quickly. Uh, other times, he's been said to have brain damage, and that's what led to him uh, having these multiple identities. Uh, we'll get into his identities in a minute. I want to go into his origin a bit. And what's interesting is that is, since this is a new character... You think they give us an origin, but they're not giving us that straight away. And I think that's for the best. Uh, I think this episode actually was a really good kind of foot in the door. I think there's plenty of time to explain this character. And what the character's origin is, is... Well, first of all, okay, he's introduced as kind of a bit of a villain, actually. He's introduced as a mercenary in Werewolf by Night 32. Uh, trying to kill Jack Russell, our, our Werewolf by Night, who was incidentally getting a Halloween special uh, on Disney this October, apparently. And they've really changed him since then. Uh, he's a mercenary who was in Egypt and is killed, killed in front of the god uh, statue of Khonshu, who is the god of the moon and of vengeance, and seemingly revived. Uh, he's revived by Khonshu uh, to basically be this avenging force, uh, to be the fist of Khonshu, and to essentially kind of right some of the wrongs he did in his life. Now... I should say, again, this is where they kind of have changed it a couple of times. Sometimes it's that Khonshu selected him long before he died in Egypt, uh, like because he had a weak mind and because he was open to psychic uh, manipulation, I suppose. Other times, uh, you know, it's like a lot of his personality traits kind of come from the god Khonshu. Uh, that's why his identities are so distinct. Uh, but basically, yeah, he is inhabited by an Egyptian god and told to act out uh, the work of an Egyptian god. And those are identities is what we should talk about. And I say four. There's, uh, it's kind of can be a little bit complex, his identities, because sometimes it, it's not, it, sometimes they kind of split the identities a little bit more. But I, I think the marketing for this is almost hinted at, like Moon Knight and, and Mark Spector are separate, but they're normally not. Like Mark Spector is Moon Knight. Um, and then we have Stephen Grant, who is his other persona. So Mark Spector is the mercenary. Stephen Grant is a billionaire entrepreneur in the comics who basically finances the work he does as Moon Knight. Here, Stephen Grant is not that. He is working in a gift shop in London. Uh, seemingly, at least for this episode, the primary identity. I won't think, I think, I don't know, is that just a kind of a misdirect? But that's what I mean when I say it didn't necessarily play as well, possibly, if you know the comics. Or it, else it played and it wasn't that surprising. Other people seemed a bit confused by it because, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that it's not Stephen Grant, that someone, you know, different identities of Stephen Grant might have been surprising to other people. 
uh, that weren't aware of Moon Knight's history. Another persona, and I don't believe this is confirmed yet for the Disney Plus show. I'd be surprised if we didn't see a nod at the very least. Uh, Jake Lockley, who is a taxi cab man. Taxi cab driver? <laughs> taxi cab man. Forget Moon Knight, I'm not Moon Knight, I'm taxi cab man. Jake Lockley uh, is a taxi driver. He keeps his ear kind of to the beat. Uh, because of that, he knows kind of what's going on in the underworld a little bit. Uh, again, not confirmed for Disney Plus show. We then have uh, Mr. Knight, who was a very recent one, actually. Only introduced in 2014 in Warren Ellis's and Declan Shalvey's run, uh, From the Dead. He goes. Uh, he wears a very distinct white suit, a uh, kind of fitted white um, mask and gloves. Uh, yeah, he is confirmed to be in the show. And he's kind of a consultant uh, to police forces. He can kind of do what things that police can't. Sort of a, a bit of a vigilante. Kind of a bit like the detective side of Batman, I guess, to a certain degree. But uh, it's, yeah, interesting. Because we really only got two personas here, sort of. But it is uh, a very unique character. And it could make for a very interesting show. I will say one thing that's interesting about this show is that it's rated 16 plus on Disney+. Plus which is more severe than any of the Marvel shows. I keep saying this show is brutal. I don't think we necessarily saw much of that here. And I should say, I'm recording this at a time when it's just been kind of revealed that Disney have changed Falcon and the Winter Soldier on Disney Plus to remove some of the blood and some of the violence. Uh, now, some people are saying that's actually was a mistake and it's going to be rectified. I don't know. I think they could edit it because of the new age rating system that they've introduced in the US, but we'll have to see. Either way, uh, forget about Moon Knight, because we're going to talk about another character against introduced in this episode. That's Ethan Hawke's character, our villain, uh, Arthur Harrow. Should also say, not... Uh, <laughs> man, they didn't waste any time introducing him today. He's literally gets the first scene in the episode. Uh, not based on a character from the comics. I think he's kind of an amalgamation of a few. But he's a this sort of religious Zeta character. We see him smashing glass with his alligator cane uh, and putting him into his shoes for some sort of mortification, presumably for his sins, uh, to appease... Uh, one of the Egyptian gods that we will get to. Uh, so yes, that's how we were introduced to him. Uh, we then get uh, a look at... I should also say, no opening credits. I, I get the feeling there was other Marvel shows that didn't have an opening credits in their first episode. I, I don't know if we're going to get them in this, maybe. I don't know. They do have some very slight end credits. But either way, uh, Oscar Isaac is who we end up with then. We end up in bed with Oscar Isaac. Well, hey, am I right, ladies? <laughs> He's tethered to the bed. I mean, who hasn't dreamed of joining Oscar Isaac in bed and having him tied up? Whoops. <laughs> oh, I let it slip. Yeah, so around his bed is a circle of sand. I did. I don't know if this was this a trick of light. It did look like there was like a light footprint before he he put his foot into it. Um, but yeah, it seemingly it wasn't um, broken up. And also there was a, a, a tape sealed on the door. So seemingly he seems to think he's a, a sleepwalker. And this would be able to tell him if he gets out. But as we see, he has been getting out later on. Uh, and whatever he's doing is very... Whoever is walking around as him is, is doing a great job covering their footsteps, covering their tracks. Uh, we have Gus, then, who's... Again, Marvel have a habit lately of introducing these animal characters that we all love. Alligator, Loki, Lucky, um, the dog from Hawkeye. But either way, uh, yeah, we have Gus, who is a, his one fin goldfish. Uh, interestingly, they, they focus on this quite a bit. He even got his own character post. So the episode is called The Goldfish Problem. Um... He he says, oh, I'll have to take you somewhere at some stage. I don't know, is that foreshadowing? Maybe the fish is actually going to be someone? I don't know. Uh, I do think there is more to this goldfish, and I've heard as much, so we shall see. But yeah, uh, he's uh, in London, which is interesting that we're not, you know, in New York where we normally are. Uh, and he works at a museum that currently has an ancient Egyptian exhibit. He's very knowledgeable of Egypt, but he only works at the gift shop. Yeah, he does talk a lot about Egypt. They're not going to let him be a tour guide, seemingly, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, but I also understand it because he's unreliably late and kind of comes off a little bit tweaky. <laughs> Sorry, he just does. Uh, so yeah, they talk. He talks a bit about uh, to a little girl who's looking at uh, the Pyramid of Giza. And he talks a bit about something interesting where he's on about how uh, the the mummification process and how basically they moved everything but the heart because the heart was going to be judged about whether or not you could get into the afterlife through the, the field of reeds, and that basically Egyptians judge you by your heart, and if your heart was good, you got to continue to the afterlife. We'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, we have him then, Just it just really gets across that he's a lonely guy, although even still, he, he gets a date, so, you know, I mean, he looks like Oscar Isaac. <laughs> you know, as, we, as we've already established, we're all okay with being in bed with Oscar Isaac. Uh, yeah, he's talking to a, a, a human statue, not a great person to chat with, if we're honest. Uh, this is actually Bertrand Crawley, who's uh, one of his friends in the comics. Uh, they didn't give any mention of it. I don't know if it was just an Easter egg. Is the character going to come back? I don't know. We also don't really know how much we're going to see in Moon Knight going forward. Uh, but we should see. Uh, he's 
clearly trying to stay awake as well. He's listening to things on how to say it, which include him messing with puzzles. He's got a Rubik's Cube uh, and also reading up on uh, Egyptian stuff. But that's when the episode kicks it up a notch because he wakes up face down with a dislocated jaw face down on a mountainside. In Germany, I believe it was. Uh, certainly the the language was in German. There was a great license plate in uh, that was a German license plate. Uh, I mean, there's other countries that speak German, so uh, who knows? But either way, it seemed to be Germany. Uh, and he's being told uh, to go back to sleep by a mysterious voice. He's still, at this point, Stephen Grant. That mysterious voice is Khonshu, the Egyptian god we talked about. It's voiced by F. Murray Abraham. We get a few flashes of Khonshu in this. Um, but he's saying, surrender your body to Mark. So yeah, Mark is the Moon Knight in this. Even though the marketing, I thought, kind of hinted that they were kind of separate. But yeah, Mark is Moon Knight seemingly. Give your body to Mark because he can kick ass, he can do this. And we get a lot of flashes of that and things. So which is, again, a very odd way to market the show. Because it's leaning on the mystery element. But what you're basically doing is, hey, all the action, you're not going to see it <laughs> yet. Because this guy is not the action guy. This is the bumbling guy. But still, kind of, I guess, the best approach, I, I do think, is probably, like, if it was done the other way around, people would be like, I don't understand, why is this guy kicking ass and all of a sudden he's a bumbling gift shop employee? Uh, would kind of be a bit of a strange one. So I do think this is probably the best way of approaching it. Uh, so we have the uh, a moment where he searches his pocket and finds a golden scarab, uh, which is a kind of MacGuffin for the show so far. And we had a flash of Conchu standing behind him. And then he starts being fired at. And the voice tells him to run, which he does, into a local village. And he stumbles across a whole crowd idolizing Ethan Hawke's character. Now, this is also where some of the Egyptian stuff comes back in and is very interesting. And when we said, I mentioned uh, both his alligator head cane and I mentioned the judging of the hearts, this is where this definitely comes into play. So from the crowd, he picks a man and he judges her in Amit's name. So Amit was a god, goddess I should say, uh, with an alligator head who traditionally stood uh, at the scales uh, at the kind of entrance to the afterlife and if your heart was judged as not being worthy she ate your heart she devoured it and in doing that basically your soul would be destroyed and you couldn't continue into the afterlife so essentially it was that your good actions are weighed against your evil actions now again I think in Egyptian mythology it was actually your heart was weighed against the feather of oh, I can't remember the other god's name um, but it was weighed against that so that's why they're all wearing the scales but there's not more to this tattoo the tattoo is enchanted or magic or something because it's genuinely moving and it judges this person to be good the next person this, this sweet old lady comes up and is not so lucky because she's just as evil and it, she just seems to pass out and die uh, not clear whether that was his uh, a power of his I don't it doesn't seem like he killed her. It just seems like, you no, know, maybe the god Amit worked through Arthur there. We're not sure. But uh, she does seem to pass out and die. Uh, one of the guards, the guards seem to be working for him because uh, they run up and he says, like, basically, oh, you know, there's this guy's on the run. Where is he? And he sa sh says, like, glory to Amit or something along the lines. And all his followers kneel down. He takes that bit too long and they spot him. I should also mention some of his followers have a tattoo of the scales as well, uh, which coming up becomes a point later. But uh, yeah, basically it's kind of like forgiving your sins and judging you before you get to the afterlife. So it's like, hey, you know, you've uh, you've been good, so you're going to be grand. You've been bad, or very pivotally, you will be bad, because it, they do say that it judges before the crimes have been committed. Uh, kind of like a minority report thing, I guess. So uh, yeah, so the guards start chasing. Uh, he tries to run away. He's like, I'm going to give you this car, but his body is not letting him. And he's still hearing this voice the whole way. Big Venom vibes <laughs> from this, the Venom... Uh, films of re of late, which not not the most, you know, not the best comparison you want, but uh, I did like the way it was done. I thought uh, Oscar Isaac was great, the kind of physical comedy. I swear he's kind of pulling his his arms away. Just I don't know why he just looked great. Uh, so yeah, something uh, happens again. Uh, this time it's more obvious in that he's surrounded by people. Kind of, you know, his eyes start fluttering. He passes out, goes, cuts to black, and he's all of a sudden he's holding the scarab. Covered in blood. A lot of blood. Maybe the most blood in an MCU show so far. Uh, and he's like, I don't know what happened. He's just, he's just like, he's like, sorry. <laughs> and then he just legs it. Uh, the whole town is now after him. And he tries to escape in a cupcake van. Which, you know, not the, the best mode of transport, but sure, it'll do. Uh, we get Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go on the radio. Uh, it's like one of the, the few times they went for comedy in this. Uh, well, there's one time later on as well. Uh, but one of the guards... Uh, 
jumps in the, onto the back of the truck and is about to get in there. He's got uh, another guy that's sidling up next to him, about to shoot him, and pass out. And wakes up, and everyone's dispatched of, uh, and he's back in control, holding a gun. Uh, not for long, though, because he throws the gun at the car, and which the voice is like, what are you doing, you dumbass? The voice loves taking the piss out of Stephen Grant. He's like, Mark is cool, not you, Stephen, you're lame. You know, not not like that, though. I mean, could you imagine getting F. Mary Abraham to read a line like that? <laughs> but yeah, uh, I will say, overall, I liked what we got out of the action scene, but it is kind of weird because, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the action is cut because it's not Stephen Grant doing it. And we're very much in Stephen Grant's POV here, you know, which I think is a good way to handle it. The whole episode is from his perspective until the end, which made a very good way of, of basically saying, oh, okay, so there is different identities here um i think that was ha an interesting way of handling it literally like stephen grant is all you know which puts us in the persona of the character and as soon as he knows he's got multiple identities the audience knows he has multiple identities which is a, a good way of handling it so uh the chase scene was okay i will say cgi in this man not good like i know people have been giving marvel some crap over their effects lately but yeah, this was not, this might be, a, uh, this was a low bar. This might have been like worse than Black Panther at times, I thought. Just not very good looking. It just looked a little bit rough, like they needed a bit more time and didn't get it done. Uh, at this point, he narrowly avoids a truck carrying logs. And just when it looks like Steven is going to die, he's got men pointing guns at him. The logs fall from the truck and crush the cars. And you're like, oh God, well, what's he going to do now? And he's back in his bed. Was it all a dream? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, as we quickly learn. First thing he notices is uh, that his fish, Gus, now has two fins. Which is very strange. Um, yeah, I don't understand what's going on here. <laughs> Did he buy a new fish? Uh, Did one of his personalities buy a new fish? Is the fish someone who can only regenerate as a fish? What's going on here? Very interesting. Uh, I'm glad that someone made a Nemo joke. Well, I'm not actually, because I was going to make a Nemo joke and they stole it from me. Uh, but he takes it to the pet shop and he's like, uh, it's, your fish is not like Nemo or whatever. And she's like, you're just crazy. Um, and then he's like, oh God, I have a date. And he runs there to get the best steak in town. And as he does, he is stood up for his date. Well, actually, no, he's someone else up for a date because he tries to ring the person he was going to go on a date with. And she was like, yeah, I was there two days ago. Uh, because he's convinced that no time has passed at all and that it's Friday. It is, in fact, Sunday. So that date didn't go very well. I also have to say, in that scene, I think they did a really good job here. Uh, and I think, again, this if this was in the hands of a lesser actor, this show wouldn't, and this episode in general, wouldn't have worked. I thought th this scene was so sad at the very end when he kind of realized that he didn't have his, you know, didn't have the grasp of sanity he thought he did. It was just really, really sad. Just, and it was just literally a close-up of Oscar Isaac's face. And I was really like, oh man, I feel bad for him now. Uh, and that you kind of should to a degree. A guy who's not, and I feel like it was kind of wacky up till then. But then I was like, oh man, it really did hit home. That this is not a good life to lead. That this is, and it's probably going to get worse for him, unfortunately. Because, you know, Moon Knight isn't always a very happy character. So uh, yeah, he's back at home now. And isn't apparent he notices some marks on the floor. And some loose boards. Kind of up on the wall. So he, he figures out where uh, the things are moved and he climbs up onto a table and looks at, and opens the loose boards and he finds a phone and a key. And we don't see him trying to figure out the key, but he turns on the phone and it, he goes through the calls. Nearly all of them are from Layla, who we'll talk about in a sec. There's also one from Frenchie. Frenchie is like his right-hand man and mercenary friend of his and his best friend basically in the comics. Seemingly Frenchie isn't going to be in this. There's a lot of actual kind of controversy about this from big Moon Knight fans that some characters uh, aren't in it. Bushman is another one of his villains that is just not in it at all. Um, and Frenchie seemingly isn't going to be in it either. But Frenchie's literally introduced in the same in <laughs> like in the same comic Moon Knight is introduced in. So that tells you how pivotal they, they, those characters are connected. But seemingly not going to be in it. But he does seemingly exist in the MCU. Uh, Layla is a more complex one uh, because there is only like one. Marvel character called Layla. Uh, she was an X-Men character. So is it a mutant? I don't know. Marvel could just be have created a character. They create quite a few characters for this show. Uh, but Layla is a character that has had loads of, loads of different powers uh, and loads of different iterations. Uh, she was a big part uh, of the kind of issues with Scarlet Witch uh, in the House of M stuff. 
she had the power of reviving some people from the dead. So I'm wondering, uh, because I think the character description they give is that this is someone with a connection to Mark's past. I'm wondering if Layla is a character that that revived Mark when he died and that's what led him to become Moon Knight, maybe? That's just kind of my own guess. That's my own theory there. You know, if you now we can say, hey, theory is in the title. Um, but yeah, she's a, a character that could really be a many things. Uh, I've seen the description here. An archaeologist and adventurer from Spectre's past. So could easily be. Uh, that is how she fits in. But she does know him as Mark and is confused at the accent. So I don't know. I get maybe this is something that only occurred recently. Maybe the identities in this scenario are because of his connection to Konshu. We don't really know. But yeah, she knows him as Mark, hangs up. Doesn't it's just, Again, it's kind of just a tease of what's to come. Uh, we also should say he's hearing a voice waking. Uh, that's speaking to him again, telling him to stop. We also get a really kind of creepy mirror shot where he looks in the mirror. And he's like, the lights are kind of flickering because, of course, you know, horror lighting. He's looking in the mirror, he sees himself, and then all of a sudden it kind of goes dark. And he's looking in the mirror again, and it looks like the head in the mirror just shakes its head, which is not something Mark is doing. So it's kind of messed up. Then he gets in an elevator. Again, this is some of the, this is probably the most horror stuff in the, the episode that I thought was really cool. But he gets into the elevator, and he presses a button to try to go to the ground floor. He ends up at like the third floor. And down the hall, we see our best look in the episode at the god Conchu, including the massive beaky head. Uh, it was really cool and it looks like he's coming closer and Mark is freaking out on the floor again, tweaking. He's tweaking. He like in in reality, you'd see this guy and be like, God damn, son, quit the meth. <laughs> um, and it's actually an old lady who is freaking the fuck out. Uh, rightfully so. She's like, I'm, I'm getting off this floor. You, you stay here. I'm, I'm meeting my friend. She's expecting me. <laughs> uh, yeah, because otherwise, you know, she could end up tied to a bed by Oscar Isaac, you know, and we all know we prefer it to be the other way around. Um, tying <laughs> Whoa. This is getting weird, man. This is only one episode in. I have to bonk, stop myself talking about Oscar Isaac. Uh, so, yeah, he's he's freaked out. Then uh, he's, later on, uh, he's on a bus to work. He's still seeing Kanchu. Uh, again, there seems to be kind of a lost time here. He kind of blacks out and wakes up on the bus, freaked out again. Sees Kanchu again. He's convinced someone is following him now. And when he gets into the museum, he's he, t he arrives at work and he's immediately confronted by Harrow. And Harrow's men, who identify themselves by the tattoo of the scales. So, the while there, there's kind of a bit more of an explanation of Amit, um, if you weren't sure. He says that the scar belongs to Amit. She was a, uh, or he says, oh, she was a boogeyman. And he says he was a boogeyman for evildoers. And she's got tired of waiting for them to commit their sins before punishment. So it almost feels like he's almost like a surrogate to be like, you're, you're, you know, you're not going to make it anyway. You know, you're going to be bad. So that's kind of where he's at. Uh, Stephen is now uh, surrounded by Harrow's followers. Uh, Harrow insists that had Amit been allowed to operate in the way she has, in other words, judging people before they'd done the bad things, many of the evils of the world wouldn't have happened. She mentioned he mentions a Hitler, uh, you know, uh, among others. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of what uh, his whole deal is. He's gonna like wipe out the evils of the world before they come to be. Uh, but she was betrayed by the other gods, is what happened according to him. Uh, he also mentions in a weird, a weird rare bit of humor. She says that, uh, you know, uh, he mentions Avatar. And he's like, oh, those blue aliens. He's like, no, the, oh, the anime. I'm like, no. <laughs> so that was kind of a weird joke. But hey, how about Harrow uh, also knows that he has a voice inside him, uh, which is interesting. And he's kind of like, uh, you know, I know your voice can't be satisfied. And he says that he can help him. And he does what he did to the other ones, which is put the cane in between his kind of uh, forearms to pass judgment on it. And normally the tattoo would show if it was going to be good or bad, but really it, it doesn't make any judgment. And he just says, there's chaos in you. At which point Stephen flees and Harrow insists to just leave him be. But uh, strangely enough, he's like, leave him be. And then two seconds later, he's like, okay, it's night now. We'll attack him now. Uh, and he does attack him in the museum. He sets loose uh, jackals uh, of kind of Egyptian folklore. They're not just dogs. Stephen here is a dog. But these are kind of like these dog face kind of monsters, basically. Um, that are skating and climbing the walls and all this and he freaks out starts running uh, as they chase him and he escapes into a bathroom surrounded by mirrors get used to mirrors we're going to see a lot of weird mirror reflections in this I get the feeling uh, and his reflection speaks to him with different mannerisms different voice um, again Moon is a character that's often also just totally imagined certain things so you know it doesn't necessarily mean he's got any powers <laughs> in case I see anyone on Twitter being like oh he can control mirrors no uh, he he um, Starts telling him basically, let me take over, give me control, and we can save us. Uh, which he does. He just get wrapped in mummy garbs, uh, a cape and a cowl, 
Moon Knight has now awakened. He delivers a brief beatdown to the Jackals from the back, turns around and then walks into the camera. And the episode ends. Dun, dun, dun. So we talked a lot about the brutality of, of Moon Knight. A lot of people have been saying this is going to be more brutal. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and check. I get the feeling that this clip was extended and a bit more dark and violent when they teased it in the first footage we saw of Moon Knight. And I think it's interesting for a couple of things. So I, I went into the personas. We we don't get all of them in this first episode, which, you know, is good. We don't want to overload the audience straight away. But I should also say there's a couple of questions we have coming out of this. First of all, what is the Scarab? Is it going to be McGuffin just for the first episode or is it going to become McGuffin going forward? Uh, what is the deal with the goldfish? And... Really, I guess, where where is this kind of going? Uh, in a more minor sense and a broader sense. Like, is it just, hey, I'm going to keep the scarab. No, I want the scarab. <laughs> uh, we didn't get an explanation for Kanchu in this, so we're assuming he's going to have to learn about Kanchu and his origin a bit, uh, which could easily be done in the flashback anyway. We don't know what the connection to Layla is. We have a lot of questions coming out of this, and it's only one episode of six uh, the bigger question then, I guess, in a larger sense is, how does Moon Knight fit into the MCU? Because a lot of people have said, and a lot of people involved in the show have said, oh, it's very disconnected from the MCU. And it certainly feels like that now. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think it makes it more refreshing. But it's that kind of thing of, like, where will this kind of fit in? You know, it's kind of hard to say right now. And it kind of reminds me in a weird way of when Guardians of the Galaxy first came out, and it was, like, really good, really different. And it was like, oh, I guess this is part of the MCU. It's just, you wouldn't really know. <laughs> it's just, it seems like its own kind of self-contained adventure. And this is a dark, kind of more horror-focused MCU thing that's kind of weirdly psychological uh, and visually horror-based in London. How does that connect to Marvel? We'll have to see uh, as the weeks go on. I don't know if we're going to get major connections. I don't know where he'll show up after Moon Knight, you know. Uh, it would be cool if, you know, we got, uh, you know, Midnight Suns, possibly, out of this, but... Who knows, I guess we could have like Blade show up maybe or, or Jack Russell as the werewolf by night. It's kind of too early to say really. But they are keep saying how uh, how disconnected the whole thing is. Uh, I should also say uh, my closing thoughts and my overall thoughts in the episode was I really enjoyed it. I'm shocked they only put out one episode though. Because it feels like just as it's sort of getting going it ends. And you know, it's cool that we get the costume in the first episode. Normally, that's the trope of the, of the last episode of all these Disney shows and Marvel shows. And I do think that some people are going to be really put off by this. People that aren't really aware of who Moon Knight is might be like, what did I just watch? I'm not sure they're going to be driven to watch more. But either way, if they do watch more and they want an explanation, I'll do my best to explain it. As I just did. And if you enjoyed that, please give this video a like. It would really help me out. And if you don't make, want to make sure you don't miss the breakdowns for the next five weeks after this hit subscribe along with uh moon knight i'm gonna have some movie reviews coming up real soon and of course plenty of other stuff on the channel already and i'm going to also be talking about some weird marvel movies soon stay tuned for that it's going to be really exciting as we go back to the rewatcher either way i've been your cult leader tom pot please come back next time because remember i'll be watching take care